Thank you. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about some of the issues that we've been asked to talk about in the Mississippi River uh, tonight. Um, Brian and I both have uh, been doing some research on uh, the river, especially the backwaters of the river, uh, Oxbow Lakes and things like that. So I'm going to let Brian start out and um, we'll, uh, we'll just hopefully you guys won't get too hot. There's water over there you can have some more of and so on. And when it gets to where, you know, you're tired of listening to me, just shut me off. Um, so, uh, introduce Brian here. Brian is uh, um, the executive director of the Nahant Marsh. He's a faculty member at Eastern Iowa Community College. Um, he's a biologist, a really good biologist, by the way. And uh, he does a lot of work with aquatic biology and so on. Uh, and so Brian's gonna start off with a little bit about uh, some of the issues that we've been talking about. Um, our biggest kind of focus here would be about things like uh, pollution, um, hab habitat degradation, and the, the issues that are coming about and how they're affected by the flooding because the flooding is continuing now and it's becoming, you know, the 100 year flood thing that they said, oh, 1965 was a 100 year flood. We're never gonna have anything like that again for another 100 years. Two years later, we had another one. Two years later, we had another one and so on. And then there was 1993 and, and and so on. So um, we're, we'll talk a little bit about that. Thanks for having me tonight. And if you can't hear me, tell me to speak up. Or if I'm talking too loud, tell me to shut up. Um, so yeah, Paul Mays is a great guy. He's a far better biologist than me. I, I, he actually hired me years ago at Muscatine Community College. So uh, I can't say enough great things about him. But um, I want to start out with the, a picture of the Mississippi River. If we think what the Mississippi River looked like at the time of European settlement in Iowa in the 1830s, it would be unrecognizable today to those people who first encountered it. The early settlers, and keep in mind there were European explorers that came up and down the river along this stretch of the river, going back to Marquette and Joliet. They were the first people in the 1600s, first Europeans to, to travel up and down the river. The early descriptions of the river were that it was a clear running river, which is hard to believe, crystal clear water. There were rocky rapids in the river in different places. Uh, they didn't talk about the muddy waters. Um, it was a river described as a river of snags and um, completely different than what we would see today. Even my grandfather who grew up in uh, Bettendorf, he's deceased now, but he remembers being able to swim across the river as a kid before the locks and dams were built. And um, so it's a, it's a totally different river. And it started out that one of the first people that surveyed the river was a, a guy named Robert E. Lee. I don't know if you've heard of him. He later was on the wrong side of history with the Confederates. But it, in the 1830s, he was actually working for the US government and surveyed the Mississippi River because they were trying to figure out how they could make it a trade route. And one of his first recommendations was to remove all the snags. The Mississippi River was full of giant dead trees everywhere. And those trees actually probably provided a lot of good habitat for fish. The other thing about fish is that um, the Mississippi River, there are early reports even down at Rockingham, which is where I work, uh, it's long gone now, but they're in the west edge, edge of Davenport. They were pulling 175 pound catfish out of the Mississippi wow. River at that time. And they described these catfish this, as the size of pigs. You know, they were just giant fish. Um, there were lake sturgeon. Even as late as the 1930s, they were pulling lake sturgeon out of the river. Here in Muscatine, there's a great photo you can find at the, the Musser Library down here of a sturgeon that was about six feet long and well over 100 pounds. So it was an abundant river, but one of the first things they did based on Robert E. Lee's recommendations was remove all those trees from the river to make it more navigable. Then the second thing they did was they built a bunch of wing dams in the river. If you've ever been on the river and you don't know where you're going, you're likely gonna hit a wing dam and damage your boat. Um, wing dams are everywhere and the purpose of wing dams was to guide the water to the main channel of the river so it maintained a deep enough shipping channel for the early uh, steamboats and things like that. Then a little later, we started hemming in the river by building levees. And 
Uh, it's not as apparent here as it is on the southern Mississippi. Um, the levees uh, really do the river a disfavor because number one, when the river would flood, it would just spread out naturally in those floodplain forests. But number two, that's how the river gets its nutrients. So when the river floods, it actually fertilizes the fir forest. It drops off all those nutrients in the forest. But the forest fertilizes the river because the river picks up all those leaves, washes them into the river, and then the bugs eat the leaves, and then the little fish eat those bugs, and on up the food chain we go. So by breaking that connection with the floodplain forest, we've actually got uh, a less healthy, a less abundant, a less diverse river, especially on the southern Mississippi. Then the next step was the locks and dams that came primarily starting in, in 1911 when they built the major lock and dam at Keokuk, and then later in the 1930s, the lock and dam system that we built to build a nine foot deep shipping channel. Those locks and dams have had a negative impact. They've had a positive impact economically. There's no question that the locks and dams are important because they are a form of a major form of transportation on the river, and a lot of companies rely on them. Um, however, uh, they slowed down the water and they allowed different areas to silt in. Normally that silt would be carried down to the Gulf of Mexico, it would build New Orleans up, but that silt is getting trapped here and it, the first place that it's silted in are all the backwater areas that were important habitat for ducks and fish and other things. So we've altered the river physically by building locks and dams, by building levees, by um, you know pulling stuff out of the river, pulling all the snags out of the river, by building the, uh, the wing dams. We've altered the river biologically as well. Um, we've introduced species that are not from here, that don't belong here. So uh, the common carp for one, later the Asian carp, zebra mussels, brittle naiad, a whole host of non-native invasive species that impact the quality of the water in the river and impact other species that do belong here in the river. Um, we've also al altered the river chemically by um, putting more pollutants in the river that are, are not naturally there. Now, some of that is non-point sources. Historically, we would have had point and non-point sources and Paul's gonna talk a little more about that. The point sources, I would argue, are probably way better controlled than non-point sources. The point sources are the ones that are coming from factories, from sewage treatment plants. There's tight regulations on those since the 1970s. The non-point sources, though, include farm runoff, include runoff from this parking lot, include runoff from your backyard. Those are the those are the main issues that we have today are from the non-point sources. And the other thing I'll mention really quickly is about flooding. So I brought a couple of uh, pictures along and I think we'll just maybe pass these around real quick. Uh, this is the same uh, image here, but I only brought two. I'm gonna set that down for just a second. What, what this image shows is, uh, this is in Davenport. This is the number of days per decade that we've had floods. Now, if you look back prior to the 1960s, I think the average number of days per decade was about 40 days out of every 10 years you would expect that the river would be flooding. The 1990s, there was over 130 days per decade that we flooded, and people thought we would never top that, except this last decade, we had over 350 days where we were flooding. So we went from about 40 days per decade of the Mississippi River flooding to this last decade, 355 days where the Mississippi was at, River was at flood. Now, um, Flooding is a natural occurrence. Um, the Mississippi River is always flooded, but it's never flooded uh, to this degree. 
to this amount of frequency and in the times that we're seeing the flooding. Historically, spring, early spring floods would happen. You know, you'd get the snow melt coming down from Minnesota and Wisconsin that fill the river basin and you'd get a, a flood. And the stuff that lives in the Mississippi River and in the backwaters was pretty well adapted to those spring floods. It wasn't a big deal. But now we're seeing a, a different thing occurring. We're seeing the snowmelt floods come in the spring. Then we're seeing heavy rain events that are coming later in the spring. And we're getting floods in the late spring and early summer. And we're even getting floods in the fall and winter now. This is totally uncharacteristic, historically speaking, of the Mississippi River. So the question is, why are we seeing so much flooding today on the Mississippi River? Is it the changes that we've done to the river? That probably has a really small uh, impact. The locks and dams really probably had a very small impact on flooding. What has the most impact on flooding are changes in our climate patterns. So you can look up the data on the National Weather Service, um, but our springs are getting much wetter than ever before. Our summers are getting drier, and then our falls are getting wetter. And so we're getting, we're, we're over, overall, the amount of rain that we're getting each year is staying pretty consistent, but it's all coming at once. And that's the problem. And so now, as a result, we're starting to see more flooding, more frequent flooding. This year in Davenport, we had an 18-foot flood. That's, a, that's a, a major flood, but it barely made the news because it happens so often now. Uh, it, you know, it's kind of like the old uh, adage of boiling a frog. If you boil a frog slowly, they'll just stay in the pot. But if you throw them in boiling water, they'll jump out. Um, well, that's what's happening with us. We're boiling the water slowly, and we haven't even noticed that this past decade was just incredibly wet. So um, what impact does flooding have? Well, the more flooding we have, uh, let me get back to why we're seeing more flooding. So we got number one is the changes in, in our climate patterns. Spring is getting a lot wetter. But number two is um, changes in land use in the upper Midwest. Now, over the last century and a half, we've altered 99.9% .9 of the prairies that used to exist in Iowa. We've changed them, we've converted them into farmland. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? The argument can be made either way, and I'm not here to judge that, but that's the reality. Prairie is like a giant sponge. When it rains on prairie, the water gets soaked in. We've converted that into cornfields and soybean fields that don't have the same capacity to hold water. And a lot of their cornfields and soybean fields, we've tiled them. And so the water that does fall on our corn and soybean fields runs off a lot more quickly than ever before. Uh, also in the Midwest, um, in Iowa especially, we've destroyed 95% of the wetlands that were once here. Wetlands are also like giant sponges. Not only do they hold water, but they also filter the water. And so our water is a lot dirtier as a result. So, um, and then finally, um, you know, so we're, we've altered the land use in the Midwest. And we, you know, we've got concrete, we've got cornfields, we've got highways, everything else. The water does not stay on our landscape like it used to. It runs off much more quickly than ever before. We've got changes in climate patterns. Um, so what is the impact of all of this additional flooding? Well, number one, we're seeing siltation rates in our backwater sloughs and even in the side channels of the Mississippi River accelerating. We've got tons of silt. If you look at this last, the last major flood we had in 2019, the water was like chocolate milk coming down the river. And wherever that water slows down, it drops off that silt load. And we're even seeing that at Nahant Marsh now, and where I work in Davenport. Um, the other thing is that it distrib distributes uh, invasive plants and invasive animals. So whenever the river swells, anything that's in there that's not a good thing ends up in places that they weren't before. So, and then, um, you know, 
this last flood in 2019 had a huge volume of water in it. So it was diluting the pollution that was in there, but there was still a lot of pollution getting in the river. Nahant Marsh is right by a train yard, and that train yard, um, their, their fuel separator system got overwhelmed, and a couple hundred gallons of diesel fuel ended up in our marsh and down the river and ended up in a big cleanup afterwards. But that was a small example of what was happening all up and down the Mississippi River that year. Point out that there's probably a lot of good things that have been going on in the Mississippi River, um, and there's been some things that we've all been concerned about for quite a while. Brian mentioned, for instance, the sedimentation rate of the river. That's probably one of the biggest problems that we have. Um, back in, eight, in the 1800s, about 1854, they, uh, the, they decided that there was, a, there was a study by two officers of the Corps of Engineers. Um, it wasn't called the Corps of Engineers at the time. It was called the Ar U.S. Army Engineering uh, Group. And they, they decided that if they narrowed the river so they could maintain uh, a deep enough uh, channel, and at that time they wanted to maintain a channel of three and a half feet for, uh, for the uh, river boats to run on. Um, you know that they had the they had the flat boats and they had the keel boats and all of those things that were going up and down the river and the river boats that were in the east uh, running on the deeper rivers in the east couldn't really run on the Mississippi so they wanted to make the Mississippi Channel deeper so that the river boats could run all the way up to St. Paul and so and of course the uh, people that were involved with the commerce in St. Paul and Minneapolis and so on they were all behind that. So they decided that they were going to uh, narrow the channel, and they narrowed the channel by one third. And the way they did that was, uh, as Brian was talking about, by making these wing dams. And the wing dams forced the water into the main channel. And then also by making uh, these dams across the, all the backwaters and the islands and so on, again, to force the water not to go out into the areas that were areas that were allowing the flood waters to, to, to spread out and so on and, and slowing down the river and during the flood and so on. But instead, we're forcing the water into the channel. And the, the idea was that the channel then would be scoured. All the silt and so on would be scoured out because the water would be moving in a, in a more narrow channel and it would keep that three and a half foot depth. Well, it didn't keep that. And besides that, the riverboat traffic started to slow down, and that was because of the advent of the railroads. And you guys probably, a lot of people have heard uh, how the railroads really kind of changed uh, the whole tenor of what went on with shipping things from the Midwest. So the, river, the riverboat companies and the commerce people on the river, because every town on the river really wanted to have a lot of commerce, they said, well, we have to... Uh, lower that channel to six feet if we do it six make a six foot channel and so they did that again by dredging as well as by doing this and they even did you know they played some shenanigans which every every government agency and and every other agency likes to do they did things like they had the uh, the head of the of the army corps come through and they uh, artificially stranded a riverboat on a sandbar and then they had the dredge come and dr dig it out and an interesting thing was the citizens of the town, I think that was at Harper's Ferry, and the uh, citizens of the town were out and they were gonna, because this happened fairly regularly, they were gonna push this thing out. And they go, no, no, everybody go home. They sent them all home so they could make their point that the dredge was gonna save the day. And so they dredged the six foot channel again. It didn't really increase uh, uh, the traffic on the river simply because of the more railroads being built and, and so on. Well. What happened with the railroads, of course, is that the railroads, when they didn't have much competition now, they raised their rates, and so now the commerce, the people, the commercial people on the river wanted to have, you know, more river traffic, and so they then uh, went to this nine-foot dredge, and that happened in the 1920s, and of course, Herbert, Herbert Hoover was the president, and he was an engineer himself, and he really was behind it, and so they went ahead and, and said that they would make the act to do that. Um, and so now we still today maintain this nine foot, uh, uh, supposed nine foot, uh, nine foot channel, but it's actually between 11 and 13 feet because the barges can barely make it at nine feet. So they actually maintain a channel of uh, 11 and 13 feet. But in order to do that, what you have to do is clean, the, clean all of the silt and so on that's now traveling down. And Brian was talking about all the, a lot of the reasons that we have this silt load coming down. 
And so we have that, and, and <clears throat> we now have a channel that we're trying to maintain, and it is a huge commercial effort. I mean, we send more grain down the Mississippi River and a lot of other products going up the Mississippi River on barges uh, than ever before. About 500 million tons a year of grain go through New Orleans and the Port of Louisiana uh, coming from the Midwest and going down there. About 40% of the grain that is exported from the United States is exported through the Louisiana ports down the Mississippi River. So it is really important. It's, it's really important that we do, that we actually have that uh, mechanism so that people actually can, can <coughs> ship their grains and so on. Um, then what we have is the conundrum of why is it that in 1850 we made the we made this uh, we made this uh, statement that th that was the policy that we kept and we kept it until the 1990s actually of of making sure that we we uh, <coughs> maintained that channel and so on and the core still said even in the 1990s well you know we maintain the channel we will actually gouge out those that channel and we'll take that silt down and it, it actually doesn't work that way um, for, for lots of reasons. The other thing that uh, I wanted to make a little point about in terms of what's going on in the river, we, we do have, after 1972, 1972 we had the Clean Water Act and after 1972 we have a much cleaner river. Uh, I grew up across the river from where Brian grew up. Brian grew up in the, over in the, uh, Bettendorf area, and I grew up across the creek over in Rock Island. And uh, we, we both have spent an awful lot of time on the river as, as kids and, and even as adults, because once you're a river rat, you just can't get off the river. So, um, so I moved to a river town. So anyway, uh, we, in, in that time frame, I know for a fact that I used to go out on the river and I used to wear my, uh, you know, my athletic, my gym trunks and so on, athletic clothes that were light, like white and so on, and come, go out on the river for a day, come back, and they'd be all dark gray and brown and all that. And it doesn't happen that way anymore, and, and probably more because I don't wear white anymore. But anyway, um, <laughs> uh, the river is a lot cleaner. And it's a lot cleaner because, actually, of that particular uh, piece of legislation and that has been improved. The legislation was improved in the 1980s, it was improved in the 1990s, and it really is excellent about maintaining control over pollutants and, and all kinds of things being put in the river from sources that we can recognize, and that's point source pollution. So we get, so we're regulating all of the water, wastewater treatment facilities. Now, there's all the stories about the things that happen. Uh, you know, I don't want to pick on anybody, but Davenport, of course, has trouble every time, every time it floods because they get overwhelmed and then they have to open up the sluice gates and let all the stuff go in the river. And Davenport always, uh, wastewater people always claim that two to three miles down the river, it's all, uh, it's already washed out and it's diluted and it's no problem. Of course, when we go out and do sampling, you know, 20 miles down the river, it's still there, but anyway. <laughs> Uh, and then the worst stories came out of, of course, St. Paul, where the, uh, um, the this municipal water system was set up with uh, the, the the sewage system was set up with the the uh, rain uh, drainage system, so that so that both of those systems ran together, and every time they had a flood, and every time they had a lot of rains, it would overwhelm the system and they just opened the gates and let everything go out. And this happened all the way up until the 1990s. And finally, they had to be sued by the EPA. I mean, there were lots of citizens groups that got together that actually started this whole thing. They changed some laws, but they, nobody enforced the laws because nobody wants to enforce the laws from a, from a powerful public uh, in, uh, entity. But uh, eventually, the EPA sued the city of uh, St. Paul in order to stop this effluent, and uh, of course that was that was from the famous uh, wastewater treatment facility. Maybe you've heard of it before, called the Pig's Eye uh, Treatment Facility. It's named after, of course, Pig's Eye, who was the guy who uh, was the famous river riverman that lived there. They also have a beer named after it. I'm not sure if the <laughs> wastewater facility is named after Pig's Eye beer or after the guy. But anyway. Uh, that changed, and when that changed, it really started people thinking a lot more about making sure that we're vigilant about all this. Now, 
That leads up to all kinds of other things that happen on all the tributaries. Uh, probably you're all familiar with what's, go what's been going on in Des Moines. Uh, Des Moines uh, water system uh, tried to sue several counties because of uh, the problem now that we have is the non-point source pollution. You can't really identify non-point source pollutants. You can identify events. So for instance, the DNR, I mean, we get uh, information practically every day on somebody that has a problem that, that sends, uh, uh, sends uh, maybe stuff from a, from a hog confinement center in, in their pit uh, overflowed or they had a valve problem or a, uh, some industry had a problem and so on and it, and it goes into a, into a, a feeder stream and the feeder stream then goes into a bigger creek and the creek goes into the river and so on. Uh, and so those things, you, you have that. that. That happens a lot. And the Iowa DNR and the Illinois DNR and Wisconsin DNR, Minnesota and Missouri, all of those states that are on the upper Mississippi River, they try really hard to, to identify those things and to stop them. And they, they try to make sure that they always, uh, that people are cleaning up and so on. But it's still really difficult to find every single case of those. In fact, this week there's been two cases where they can't identify the source of pollutants. One of them where there's some white milky substance that's run into a creek up in northern Iowa that uh, killed some fish, but since they did the testing a couple of days after they heard about it, uh, the water is now clear. As you know, when you test the water at this point today, that's not the same water that you're testing tomorrow or the next day and so on, and that water keeps changing. And so uh, it is really difficult to, to deal with this non-point source pollutants. And, but, in general, and there's been lots and lots of studies, the Upper Mississippi River Conservation Committee has uh, worked with all of the five, state five states and their agencies uh, in trying to make sure that they maintain some data about what's going on. And over the long haul, the last data that came out was a report from 2018, and over the long haul, most of the <coughs> chemical pollutants that we're used to are pretty much diminished in the river. Um, there are some problems. Mercury is always a problem, partially because mercury is naturally occurring. Mercury is naturally occurring in rocks and so on, in the northern part especially of, of the watershed. And also mercury, of course, comes from uh, uh, producing energy from coal fire generators and so on. And even though we have lots of scrubbers today and so on, some of that gets in the atmosphere and some of the atmosphere. And mercury is one of those weird chemicals that it doesn't just recombine and, and you know, go away. It, it kind of stays and so on. A lot of these chemicals that we have issues with also, by the way, are, are chemicals that, that get into the silt that we've been talking about and they stay and then they come back after. So, um, cadmium is another one that's kind of an issue. Aluminum is, a, is a, a chemical that is a naturally occurring chemical in, a large, in large amounts and has no problem. So there, it's not that everything is bad. There are, there are some things that are, that are pretty okay. Um, another big issue is uh, something that we call biological oxygen demand. When we, when we test water for uh, uh, the amount of oxygen that's in the water and what's being used in there, if the, uh, if the demand is high, if there's a lot of uh, nutrient in the water. The demand is high because lots of these microorganisms will start to grow and they'll start to use up the oxygen. The oxygen will not be available then to the larger organisms, larger uh, fish, for instance, and uh, macroinvertebrates and so on. And so that's always an issue when you have pollutants coming into the water. Nitrates and nitrites are a big issue with that. Um, we do have some spills and so on that are consistent in the river. And uh, in, they come basically from tributaries and so on. Um, there is a group of people over at the University of Iowa in the hydrology lab over there that spend a lot of time watching these things. And uh, they have done a study just this past year they, where they actually could, can uh, trace individual uh, molecules coming down the Mississippi River and down the Missouri River from different places in Iowa and watch what happens to them as they go down. And it turns out that, I don't know if we should be proud of this or not, but the Mississippi River in Iowa is not as nearly as dangerous in terms of putting nitrates and nitrites and, and pollutants into the river 
as northwestern Iowa, which puts it into the Missouri River. And they can trace those uh, elements going down the Missouri River and out into the Mississippi, into the, uh, basically by the time you get down to where the Missouri dumps into the Mississippi River, you're almost at the lower Mississippi. Depends on who you are. Barge companies say the lower Mississippi starts at Cairo, Illinois, where the Ohio River comes in. Other people like to say St. Louis, so that's where the Miss Missouri River comes in. But at any rate, the lower Mississippi has a lot, a lot more pollution than the upper Mississippi because it's draining, of course, the Ohio River, and it's also draining the Missouri River. But a lot of that, and according to the data that they collected at the University of Iowa, uh, it's something like 49%, think about that, 49% of the pollutants in the lower Mississippi River, which actually goes out into what we call the hypoxia area, the dead, dead zone in the, in the Gulf of Mexico, that comes from Northwest Iowa. And the reason it comes from Northwest Iowa is because of lots of channeling of streams up there, a lot more agriculture that's, that's uh, putting lots and lots of chemicals on the ground, and a lot of livestock. There's an awful lot of confinement centers and uh, turkey uh, and chicken and um, cattle production in Northwest Iowa that we just don't have as much of in the eastern part of the state. So all of that combined is, is leading to a whole lot of this uh, uh, <coughs> nitrates and nitrites and all these nutrients that are getting, that are washing through the land. And of course, the things like Brian was talking about, what we do today in order, and especially Northwest Iowa was, full of prairie potholes. They've been drained. The way you drain them is you tile and you make sure that you, you get all that stuff rushing quickly off your land so you can save your crops and so on. And so that moves more of these nutrients out into the river. And so there are lots of issues that are going on. We are not at the point yet where we can say the river is uh, really clean and so on, but it, but it certainly is a lot better than it was in the 70s or 80s. It's continually getting better. There, we're watching that all the time and we're seeing some some pretty nice things happening. I think one of the biggest problems that we have is uh, the loss of back of backwaters and all of, all of these places that are really nurseries for all kinds of organisms. Um, I kind of struggle whether I should bring up the whole idea of what happens to the Mississippi River mussels in Muscatine, but I think it needs to be said. Uh, you know, we had three major uh, times when we had extirpation of river mussels. Uh, and two of the times were pretty much associated with activities in the Muscatine area as well as lots of other areas up around uh, further north and, and south of here because of the value of mussels. You know, the river was kind of ignored for a long time and then the, the story about uh, Beppel that came over and, and had a, a, a mechanism for making a, a, a button button punching machine where you punched out the, the, uh, <clears throat> the little cores of, of the muscles and so on. And, and so um, that really increased, you know, uh, a lot of you in here probably know a lot more about the history of the uh, muscle industry in Iowa than I do, but I know we, we've seen everywhere from around the numbers, around 33 different muscle, uh, I mean, d different button factories in town at one time and hundreds of people that were doing this on their own and so on and so forth. But because of the increase in, in clamming from the early, in the early 1900s, uh, the federal government was watching it and three times decided that they needed to put some kind of curbs on clamming, but they never did because they didn't want to stop the industry. The industry was, was uh, fairly powerful at the time, was going pretty, pretty well. And so they watched it and watched it and finally they, had to, they said, well, we're gonna we're gonna put some kind of limits on this. People were using these crow bars, you know, the, the crow feet bars and so on, going through there. And um, what happened was uh, they just couldn't catch enough clams. And so when they decided to put limits on it, it was too late. The, the clams were basically gone. So then a lot of those companies left. And then another time, some more came back. And then of course the most recent one uh, many of us remember is that in the 1990s, uh, those clamshells were being used uh, to cut out little, <coughs> little starters for uh, cultured pearls. We were selling the clams from here. They went down bas basically to Kentucky and Tennessee, and then they went out over to Japan where they uh, made little st uh, starters for 
uh, the culture of pearls and so on, because the nacre, the, the hard substance in the, in the uh, clams from Mississippi River, or the, the tributaries of the Mississippi River, the, the upper Midwest, because of the, the high mineral content that we have, made some really fine clam shells, and so they really wanted those. And it was even to the point at the very end of this when people were really, uh, there were, a lot of the clams were dying for various reasons. One of the reasons was that they were being, the, the beds were being basically cleaned out, but also uh, there were additional uh, chemicals and so on coming in the river, and these beds that had these small uh, clams that couldn't grow and so on, they would die. They were actually selling the dead clam, the clam shells from the dead clams. They'd clean them out and try to make it so that they weren't so rotten <laughs> and sell them because it was, oh, anyway. There were three different time periods when, we, when, when the clam beds sort of were, were uh, devastated. Since the 1990s, there have been a lot of changes, environmental uh, regulations, and there have been a lot of people that have been trying to do this. And there, there's other issues involved with it. Uh, the glaucidia, which are the, the little larvae of the clams, need to attach to the gills of fish uh, in order to grow large enough so that then they can drop off and, and uh, settle in the, in the silt on the bottom and so on. And uh, we've had some competition. Uh, between the different fish. Uh, some of the fish have not been able to get up the streams and so on. For instance, some of the gizzard shads that are really important for the Glaucidia haven't been able to go in certain places, be again, because of changes that we've done to the river. And besides that, of course, the biggest challenge has been uh, <clears throat> invasive clams that we've uh, gotten in. So, so what we have is now a lot of changes to the river. We, Ryan, Brian talked a little bit about some invasive, invasive species of fish. We have quite a few of those that are uh, causing problems now with uh, the river. We have some invasive species of clams that are uh, causing problems, really big problems with the river and problems with our own clams and so on. So there's quite a few issues here. Uh, we probably could talk for four or five days about all the different issues and so on that are, that are, uh, that are um, affecting the river. Um, one more thing I, I want to talk about in terms of uh, in terms of the flooding, Brian mentioned a lot of the things that that are that are issues that help to increase water flow into the river. Uh, we are, we there's no question that climate change is a big issue. Uh, and then after you have that change of of the weather patterns and so on, why don't we keep why can't we keep the water on the, on the ground? You know we have these huge aquifers under the ground that have always been, re, uh, always been recharged and so on every time that there's big rains and all of that, and the river goes up and recharges those aquifers. And one of the reasons we can't keep them is because of <clears throat> the flow patterns of the river, all, all the things that Brian was talking about, the way that we're uh, changing our, our environment uh, from a prairie state to, and, and not just a prairie state, but all five of the states uh, that are on the upper Mississippi River, all of them have changed their prairies and so on, uh, to an agricultural community and so on. And, and there's nothing particularly wrong about that, but, but water flow needs, we need to take care of that. We've lost a lot of wetlands. And the other thing uh, that I think is also really important is that we lost lots of the northern forests and the forests in the wetlands. We're cutting trees like crazy, and we have been forever. And, and the forests are really good at absorbing a lot of water and allowing us to regenerate the aquifers and so on. So those are all some issues that I think we can talk about. My part too, you know, it's not all doom and gloom and I think there's signs of hope. I wanted to talk about a couple um, things, at least in terms of legislation here in Iowa. One of them is the, uh, the Fund for Conservation and um, Recreation. And this was passed, it's also known as I Will. This was passed back in 2010. And what it is, and some of you may be familiar with it, but this went to a vote and well over 60% of Iowans voted to support this. And so the way, and this is in Iowa code now, it's in our law, that if there is a, ra a raise in our state sales tax by a penny, three eighths of every penny that's generated will go to support conservation in the state of Iowa. It will uh, ultimately provide about $180 million, it's estimated, in funds to support 
uh, protection of watersheds, to create new recreational opportunities. Uh, so it's awesome. That would be an incredible amount of money to, to better our state, to better our water quality, to, to give uh, nature here a chance. The problem is we have not raised that sales tax yet. And um, I, th I think it was gonna happen this year, but COVID hit and that put it out the window. So, um, you know, be one thing I would say, you know, this has got bipartisan support. It's a positive thing for the state. It can, it'll end up generating new revenue streams in terms of people who have come here to recreate the whole nine yards. So I think that will happen eventually. It can't happen soon enough, in my opinion. The other thing is on the Mississippi River, years ago, there was legislation passed on the federal level to um, rebuild all the locks and dams on the river. And tied to that was a whole bunch of environmental stuff that would improve like fish passage for fish on the Mississippi River would uh, have dollars for enhancement of the backwater areas and the islands on the Mississippi River. And so the problem is those dollars have never been appropriated. And so, you know, the legislation has passed. It's just the funding has never been appropriated to do that work. Number one, to improve our locks and dams, which have a huge economic benefit for uh, shipping grain and a whole lot of other things. but. The thing I'm excited about is all the funding that will come in to help improve uh, water quality and habitat on the Mississippi River. Um, there are signs of hope everywhere, and I think, you know, if you've ever seen Field of Dreams, Build It, They Will Come, um, that really is the story of Nahant Marsh. We, we took this uh, degraded wetland, if you're not familiar with our story, it was, a, it was a gun club and it was a place where people all through Davenport would throw their trash and we literally have found every piece of trash you can think of from tires to motorcycles to even ATM machines without cash in them unfortunately. But all those things were dumped in the marsh over the years and it was a degraded problem. But a, a huge uh, community effort got behind cleaning up the marsh in the late 90s it was declared an EPA Superfund site they scooped out, you know, 140 tons of lead out of the marsh. And um, on that original 78 acres, we've managed to grow it to 305 acres. And, you know, today we have 430 different species of plants there. We've documented over 212 different types of birds living there, and about half of those are nesting on site. Uh, 42 different mammals. Um, 15 different reptiles and amphibians. So it's incredible if you build a place, what will come back to it. We even have bald eagles nesting there. It's the first bald eagle nest in Davenport city limits in probably over 100 years. Um, so if you provide just a little bit of habitat, it's incredible what can survive and what can thrive for the next generations to, to enjoy and, and explore. Um, um, I don't know if you have any other... Do you want to say something about hydropower? Hydropower, yeah, okay. So uh, hydropower is one of those mixed bags. Uh, there's, there's good things and bad things about hydroelectricity. Um, I, I have mixed feelings about it. I don't like, personally, don't like to see new dams being built just for hydroelectric power because the dams create a whole lot of other problems. But if we have existing dams, you know, why not add some hydropower? The first major dam built on the Mississippi River was the dam at Keokuk, built in 1911. And it was really built for hydroelectric generation with, um, with navigation in mind. That was a, it was an area called the Keokuk Falls, and it was a treacherous area for steamboats to navigate through. And so they knew they needed a dam but there was plenty of fall there, and so uh, that, it's pretty incredible. That dam, which is well over 100 years old, is still producing electricity from the Mississippi River today. So um, I think, you know, we need to look at alternative energies. Coal is, is dirty, and it, it is, um, you know, it, it, it's not going to last forever. We have a pretty good supply of coal in the United States, but there are other ways of doing it. Wind is one. 
uh, solar is one and hydropower is one, but there's no free lunch with any of those, you know. Uh, wind power, there's, there's issues with it. Solar power, there's issues with it, the, the resources that they need to make them. And hydropower, certainly there's uh, potential issues with it as well. There is a hydro dam in Rock Island that is uh, in disrepair and not being used right now. And I think the city of Rock Island is looking to dump it off on somebody. If anybody's interested in buying a hydro dam, oh, yeah. uh, you could certainly get a hold of them. But um, certainly has potential. And I think it's something that we, you know, as a society should explore more of on our dams because they're already there. So um, there is potential for that. Um, it, I, I, I guess we're about out of time, but do you, do you folks have any questions for us? There, the Mississippi River, I'll say this too, is so big and so complex that we just scratch the surface of, of the issues and the, the possibilities and the good things and the bad things going on. But uh, yeah, questions back here. I, I think there's uh, actually... Um, there's a group doing that. They're voted by Kent Peets, Rich Dwyer, and others. Yeah, I think they're exploring uh, a series of ports all from the Quad Cities down to Muscatine. And I don't know enough about that. I know enough to be dangerous. I work with a guy named uh, Bob Sinkler occasionally who is a retired colonel from the Corps of Engineers. And he is kind of spearheading a group to explore um, having ports on the river. I think it'd be a, a, a positive thing um, to bring back to our community. You know, all of these towns on the Mississippi River were port cities essentially at one time. And we've kind of lost that over the years, but. Yeah. I think somehow they have to generate enough cash cool out of this great idea for humanity and the river to make it pay. But right. it's, it's up, and Dan, you would be pursuing it too. I think it was a little more hot now, but I don't think it's dead. Right, yeah, I think there's... You want to be able to ship a lot of, all your friendship up and down, and have a little cash flow, we could do it. <laughs> yeah. I don't mean it that, but thanks, good question. Which dryer's a good person to ask? I just had a question, it sounds uh, like some short, not just planting more trees and, uh, and I'll say a lot of farmers have implemented and I, I think this gets to federal and state level policies just for one making more incentives for farmers to do things like cover crops are a really beneficial thing there's lots of studies coming out of Iowa State now about the benefits of putting on cover crops in between corn and you know soybean plantings. They hold the soil in place, they hold the nutrients in place. Buffer strips, trees, uh, there's a lot of great practices that can be implemented that uh, will slow down erosion, capture nutrients, all that good stuff. Raise your hand. Yes. Where does the name of the marsh come from? Ah, good question. Nahant. Um, so we've been doing all kinds of research on this. Um, first of all, there's a uh, place in Massachusetts, they call it Nahant out there. They don't say it right, we say it right, <laughs> Nahant. Um, but it, it's an Algonquin Indian word that roughly translates to land between the waters or point, and which if you've ever been to Nahant Marsh, it is a piece of land between the waters. There's a marsh on one side and the Mississippi River on the other. Um, but we think it probably came, uh, it start, that area started to be known as Nahan around the 1880s. So we think it was probably coming from settlers as they were moving across from the Boston area that Nahant was already established out there and kind of the name followed. So. Raise your hand. Okay. Yes. What are considered the best cover crops and also uh, what are nitrates and nitrites and what's the difference? Well, okay, so let's start with nitrates and nitrites. They're all forms of nitrogen. Nitrates are, um, so nitrites are a little less stable. When they get into the water, they eventually turn into nitrates or ammonia or other things. Um, farmers will put ammonia on their crops. Uh, that's just another form of 
of uh, nitri nitrogen. Um, there, there is, um, in terms of drinking water anyways, there are um, standards for nitrate levels. And if you exceed those standards, bad things start happening. There, there's certain cancers that are linked to high levels of nitrates. So if you have a well, you probably have tested for nitrates. Um, babies will turn blue if they drink water with high levels of nitrates. It's called blue baby syndrome. It's uh, not good because the nitrate blocks binding of oxygen in their blood. But the, from an ecological standpoint, nitrates and nitrites cause algae to grow out of control. So if you drive around you know, the Midwest in the summer, you can see these farm ponds that look like green pea soup. They're so thick with algae. Well, that is not necessarily a good thing because that algae eventually dies and then it sucks the oxygen out of the water and you get hypoxia. The fish die with it. So that, that's the issue with nitrates. And then your question was about cover crops, which are the best and worst. I don't, that's a good question. Um, I, I can answer some of them. Uh, well, first of all, one of, the, one of the programs that Brian was talking about uh, that we have now is called uh, uh, Prairie Strip, uh, where, we, where we do farm, on farms we put places where there are waterways, we put strips in there, we put prairie uh, grasses in there and prairie forbs and so on. And that is much better at absorbing the water than allowing the water to run down. And a lot of people put things in to their strips where they can actually, uh, you know, the forage crops and so on, like for instance, some people put some hay in there that they that they can uh, that they can actually uh, harvest it and so on and and make that portion of their field still pay for them, which you can also do with the prairie strips. The problem with the prairie strips is that you only get to harvest it a couple of times instead of four times a year, like most of the people around here do with forage crops. Um, but in terms of cover crops, a lot of them it depends on what you want to do with your ground. So, for instance, a lot of people that have uh, cattle that they're going to run through uh, uh, pastures and so on, if they um, have a corn field or a bean field and then they want to put a cover crop for the wintertime, you can put things like rye on there or oats or something, and then they, they can actually turn the cattle uh, out there later in the winter and allow them to have forage, and, and it saves them from just feeding hay all winter and, and grains and so on. Um, you can also put anything that has any kind of legume that is going to be able to uh, put some nitrogen back into the soil and so on. And so there's a lot of different leguminous uh, crops and so on that people like to put in there. Um, and so a bunch of the clovers and so on are, are really good for that. Now, th then you get into the issue of are you putting more European or, or uh, Eur Eurasian crops on your ground uh, and maybe not doing the best thing you can if, as if you were to put prairie uh, seeds down there where you could actually put this, the native plants that are already adapted to this area uh, that actually grow better, um, that will survive the winter no matter what, and also provide things like forage and, and hay and so on. So there's, there's a lot of issues there. It's up to the individual, but certainly anything that you put on the ground that, that prevents runoff or that prevents uh, wind erosion. Uh, around here, of course, uh, Brian and I both work quite a bit down on, on the island, uh, at Big Sand Mound and so on, and pretty familiar, and a lot of you might be familiar with the fact that, you know, the sand down on the island, it blows all winter long, and so people always have to put cover, cover crops down there just so that they have land left in the springtime. And so it's pretty, pretty common to put uh, rye down there in the wintertime, but also you can put other kinds of cover crops. Roger, did you have a question? I was going to ask, I uh, understand um, from my wife, who is more widely informed than I am, is uh, you have a lot to do with Nayant Marsh? Yes, yeah, I'm the director down, yes. Uh, I've touched around it, I've walked around it, I've known about it, I've read on the meetings on it and so forth. I'm just curious right now, what today are legal activities for people who want to recreate in terms of fishing or hunting or canoeing or sure. paddling or uh, trapping or what else? What's yeah. prohibited in that? Well, so we manage it kind of as a right. nature preserve. And so 
we do allow fishing on, we have a catwalk on the main road, Wapalo Avenue there. We allow fishing there and there only. We, uh, we encourage hiking, bird watching, our trails are open anytime during daylight hours. We don't allow hunting. Um, we're not necessarily opposed to it if we found that the deer numbers were exorbitantly high or some other we would consider doing a controlled hunt. Um, but right now our deer numbers are low. The big flood that we had last year drove a lot of the deer up on the bluff and they kind of haven't returned. Uh, we don't allow trapping um, uh, mainly because there's a lot of people that recreate down there, walk their dogs and you know that we don't want to issue with that. Um, but sort of low impact, uh, you could, all of you, we would invite you, we're gonna be doing a big master planning for the whole area down there with I the know, Corps I of know. Engineers. Part of, part of the impetus for the closure initially was a uh, trap shooting ground that uh, lead contaminated a big part of it. And, uh, Correct, yeah. Yeah, so, um, and you know, with that legacy, uh, obviously people would be a little leery about allowing hunting or shooting down there, but, um, but yeah, we are gonna be doing a large master planning with the Corps of Engineers and we're gonna be soliciting public comment. And so, you know, we would encourage you all to participate in that. And that's not just for Nahant, but it's our whole surrounding area, including Credit Island and the Milan Bottoms across from us. Um, so, it, you know, if you have an interest and we, we want your feedback on how we can manage that for the future and protect different areas and all that good stuff. So. Thank you. Other questions? I, I, would, I would like to do one more thing because uh, Sue Johansson asked me to do this, but uh, she asked me to bring a couple of books that I think if people are interested in reading because she loves to read and she loves to do that, um, that, that are teacher that are pretty uh yeah pretty good books to give you some kind of background on what we've been talking about and so on uh one of the best ones i think is immortal river by calvin fremling it's a pretty pretty good book i'll, I'll have these books up if you want to see it um another one is the river of conflict river of dreams uh by <coughs> maloney whiting young this is a little dated well, actually both of these are a little dated uh this one's even more dated they're in the they were written in the late 90s and early uh, 2000s. I think this one uh, was published in 2004. This one was in 2002 or something. But they're pretty good background, a lot of background on, on issues. And, and the Musser Library has an awful lot of books about the Mississippi River. Uh, some of them are better than others. Some of them are pretty, pretty good. Um, there's another one that, that talks about a lot of the issues that we were talking about because they're issues about uh, really water, they're water issues. Water uh, that, that is draining through, uh, through uh, Iowa and down into the Mississippi and so on. It's called a watershed year anatomy of the Iowa floods of 2008. Some of you may be familiar with this. Uh, so Connie Mutel, uh, who is retired now from the University of Iowa, she was a writer for the hydrology, uh, the, uh, what is it? The, Geological Department, Department of Geological Engineering Hydrology uh, Department. Anyway, she, she has written a lot of books. I actually talked to this group uh, last year about her book about global warming, which is also an excellent one. Uh, I think it's called the Sugar Creek Year or something like that. But anyway, the watershed year, what she did was basically edit it. And there's all kinds of experts uh, that were talking about what happened in the flood of 2008. Uh, now, this is. Uh, primarily geared towards what happened in Cedar Rapids and, and Iowa City because that's where the most economic damage was done. There's not a lot of stuff in here about Wapalo, for instance, but uh, the issues are the same issues. The issues are the perfect storm that came, actually two storms that had to do with climate change coming across and hitting at the same time and so on. And so that's a really good issue, to give, a really good book to give you background. And then a newer book that has come out recently, Art Cullen's Storm Lake. It has an awful lot of stuff in here. Art Cullen is a, yeah, Art Cullen is a, a newspaper editor from Storm Lake. And there's a lot of stuff in here, but there are a couple of chapters that, are, that have to do with what we've been talking about in terms of uh, issues of land use and uh, what we as as a society need, need to start thinking about doing. This is, again, it's mostly about what's happening up in 
northwest Iowa, but uh, like I said, some of those issues are really big. So I think this is a good book uh, also to give you some background in that, in that the, area. Uh, Monsanto property that became the Bayer property uh, mm -hmm. is uh, 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 sort of an extension of Muscadine Island. Yes. And I'm curious as to how much of the learnings of of the Leopold's Sand Country Almanac applies to that part, this part of our territory. <laughs> you want to take uh, actually a lot of it. I mean, uh, yeah, Leopold um, was the first person to actually make a, an academic study out of environmental issues, uh, and he, you know, he came about it the hard way. Of course, being a uh, being a, an Iowa native from Burlington, uh, his grandfather started the Leopold uh, uh, Furniture Factory down there, which of course my father worked at as a young boy. But anyway, I'll go into that. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so a lot of the stuff that he brought to the fore are, are basic issues that we actually deal with all the time. And, and when he was uh, trying to, re I would say, regenerate nature on his farm, uh, which is what the Sand County Almanac is yeah. partially about. Um, he did a lot of kinds of experimentation that even today we're using that. And like I said, Brian and I both work at the Big Sand Mound, and uh, we have a big committee of a lot of people, botanists and zoologists and um, even bird people. Uh, anyway, uh, and, and uh, we have people, uh, Mark Anderson from the archaeologists and so on, that work there. And we have a big committee that tries to, and all of the uh, the Muscatine County Conservation and the Wiser County Conservation, Fish and Wildlife Service, Corps of Engineers, and the Iowa DNR all together working on, and, and TNC, Nature Conservancy, all trying to, uh, you know, make decisions that make sense down there. And it's really difficult because it's a, it's a very dynamic system down there and things are changing and all we have is 510 acres of what used to be 27,000 acres of the sand prairie on Muscatine Island. So, we're trying, to, we're trying to take riparian areas and wetlands and, and woodlands, upland woodlands, and uh, also uh, the prairie itself and try to make some decisions and try to make the right decisions. I hope it's working. I don't know. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Square. Yeah. Wonderful. Do you know uh, City of Muscatine for a number of years now has, has uh, been utilizing a, a uh, number of Separating the sewers. Yeah. All right, there's been a lot of that done there. Yeah. Uh, I got a privilege of working on some of the projects back in 910, whatever. Um, I retired in 2013, and I was sitting here and then they asked, you know, I probably got, wait a minute, it's about six or seven years after that, so they really had a lot of time to get that to those projects done. Do you know if, uh, how they're coming with that? What well, our neighborhood, they're doing it, but I don't think they're done yet. Not yet done yet. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say, because one of the things, you see them out there for a year, year and a half, and that's, that's one project. And, and then they got to wait half a year and a year in order to collect enough money from the one cent sale. You know, whatever the one cent thing there, to, uh, to uh, get, the, get the million dollars or two million dollars to bring back in for some money. And that, that's true all through uh, a lot of the river cities in Iowa. Davenport, for instance, has been trying to separate their storm sewer from their sanitary sewer for years. And you know, I, they're probably 30 years away from being done. I don't know for sure, but um, yeah, I mean, we've got, and that, and that is a that is a problem that affects the river, probably to a lesser degree today than it did um, 50 years ago. But uh, you know, separating out sanitary sewer lines from the stormwater, and um, I think there's a major project um, being proposed for the city of Davenport to to deal with that well, issue. You're an engineer, but cheers to Muscatine for taking it on. Well, yes. uh, but again, what, the, the driving force was the EPA. Mm. Right. So they had a court case or whatever it was, and, and the city of Muscatine and the EPA had to work out a method there. And, and again, so they had how many years? I was 26 years or 13 years or whatever. Huge number of years. And, and some ways along with it, that's where Muscatine implemented it once. Mm -hmm. 
I believe I'm going to be doing this for the next three years. I'm going to be doing something like 2028. Yeah, so once again, a lot of things are driven not out of the goodness of their heart, but legislation, of course. So, yeah. Well, thank you all very much. and uh, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for coming out on a nice hot day.